This video is all about the solid state of matter. We're all familiar with the idea that when you take a liquid and cool it down, it eventually solidifies. As the atoms or molecules slow down, start nestling up close to one another, become stationary, and start becoming engaged in relatively strong intermolecular forces. When a liquid freezes to a solid, it can do so in one of two ways, either an ordered way or a random way. If the atoms or molecules freeze in such a way that they form a regularly ordered pattern of atoms or molecules, we get what's called a crystalline solid. The beauty of crystalline solids is that a very small number of atoms or molecules tells us about the structure within the entire material, since the same pattern involving maybe three or four atoms, for example, in a crystalline metal is just repeated throughout the entire material. It's a great way to get structural information at the single atom or molecule level. Many solids, however, have a random arrangement of the atoms or molecules. These are called amorphous, and they contain their particles in random orientations and somewhat random positions with respect to one another, although in both of these types of solids, we've got the molecules relatively stationary, not moving very much, maybe vibrating slightly about their positions, but not really able to flow, for example, over one another. As an example of crystalline and amorphous materials, silica, which has the chemical formula SiO2, exists in either crystalline or amorphous form. So on the left here, we see a sort of a regular pattern of hexagons in the structure, right? And these hexagons indicate that we're looking at a regularly ordered set of SiO2 units. This is crystalline silica on the left. On the right, we can see the SiO2 units arranged in a more random way, where we don't have those regular shapes that we have in the crystalline solid. This is amorphous silica. We can classify solids a number of different ways. And we're going to now survey some of the most important classes of solids and how we think about them. So first, we have the ionic solids, and these are sometimes simply called salts. They consist of positive and negative ions in a regular lattice. An example of an ionic solid is sodium chloride, Na plus Cl minus. Ionic solids tend to be relatively hard and brittle and difficult to break or crack. And if you've ever tried to do this with a large crystal of sodium chloride, you know this intuitively. The reason for this is that the positive and negatively charged ions form a pretty tightly held lattice. And the only way to break a crystalline ionic solid material is to disrupt this strong attraction of the opposite ions to one another. So ionic solids only crack when a very large number of ions are displaced at one time, and this tends to take a relatively large amount of force, indicating that the material is brittle. Now ionic solids in the solid form are non-conductive because the ions are stationary, but in situations where the ions get moving, these materials become conductive. So for example, when the material is molten, when sodium chloride is melted down into liquid Na plus Cl minus, it becomes conductive. And when sodium chloride is dissolved in water to form an aqueous solution and the ions are freed up and able to flow throughout the solution, we again get a conductive situation. Metallic solids are typically elemental materials of the metallic elements, although alloys also fall into this category, and copper is one example of a metallic solid. Metallic sol solids are malleable. They can be shaped into a variety of different shapes. They're lustrous, shiny, right? They reflect light, and they are conductive. They can conduct electricity. The reason metallic solids can conduct electricity is it's often best to think about these as a sea of negatively charged electrons in which positively charged nuclear buoys are floating, quote unquote. These buoys in the sea of electrons are positively charged and thus attracted to the negative electrons, and electrons can sort of flow through the material even though the nuclei are sort of stuck in place. The sea of electrons model for a metallic solid is an important model to keep in mind. The malleability comes from the fact that metallic bonds are relatively weak relative to, for example, the ionic bonds in something like NaCl. The metallic bonds in copper are relatively weak, and so we can move the atoms past one another with enough force. This allows us to shape the material and mold the material under moderate forces. For example, it doesn't take quite as much force to shape copper as it might take to break a crystal 
of sodium chloride. Solids may also contain covalent bonds, and those may appear in discrete small molecules or in very, very large networks of atoms linked by covalent bonds. Network solids consist of this very large web of atoms linked by covalent bonds, and this slide shows a number of examples. Diamond, silicon dioxide, or silica, SiO2, silicon carbide, and graphite are all examples of covalent network solids, and the thing to pay attention to here is that the atoms are linked via a very large web of covalent bonds. So within each of these, we can find a repeating unit. That repeating unit is linked through covalent bonds to other repeating units within the structure. So they may be crystalline or amorphous. Network solids may be crystalline or amorphous, but we find these repeating units within all of these structures in some form. Within graphite, just as a point of interest, we actually have sheets of planar or roughly planar covalent bonds. Each sheet is called graphene, and graphite itself is a stack of graphene sheets. Solids can also be molecular, consisting of small molecule units, and molecular solids may be crystalline or amorphous. So the small molecules can settle into well-ordered positions or randomly oriented positions. So for example, here in solid carbon dioxide, we have actually a regular lattice of CO2 molecules. It may not look regular, but if you stare at this long enough, you'll realize that the CO2 molecules are aligned in a regular pattern. And we can find, for example, CO2 molecules where you see the black circles here. So carbon dioxide, as it's drawn here, is a crystalline molecular solid. The solid iodine drawn here is an amorphous molecular solid with the molecules arranged in relatively random orientations. So molecular solids may be crystalline or amorphous, and crystalline molecular solids are very, very important for elucidating the structures of small molecules. If we can get a small molecule into crystalline form, we can use X-ray diffraction to identify where the atoms are located in one of the repeating units of the crystal to get an idea of how the atoms are bonded to one another and what the molecule looks like. And of course, the properties of a solid depend on its type. And this table just summarizes this idea for the four classes of solids we've looked at, ionic, metallic, network covalent, and molecular solids. So the properties differ, and there are a variety of examples listed in the table. I won't go through the examples in too much detail. One thing I will point out is this third column, the type of attractions involved between atoms or molecules in the various types of solids. Understanding and appreciating this will often give you a sense of the reasons behind the differences in properties for these different types of materials. For example, the fact that ionic solids are held together via ionic bonds allows us to predict and conclude that they'll be relatively brittle. The fact that molecular solids are held together through IMFs indicates to us that it's likely that they'll melt at relatively low temperatures, low relative to, for example, ionic salts. So appreciating the types of interparticle or intermolecular attractions, whether they're bonds or IMFs, going on within a solid gives us useful information about how we would expect that solid to behave.